Chapter 17. Ernie's. 2.50pm. It didn't take long to locate the bar online. Yet again a quick Google search and there it was. East 26th Street. Less than 200 yards from Madison Square Park, where Ernie set up his new business with Robbie. The search didn't reveal much more than the address. No official website and the images only showed the front of the bar. It was definitely the same as the one behind Norman Templeton in the picture in the New York Times foyer. The same gold lettering and green background. That picture of Norman was taken in 1987, so the bar must have been there at least 32 years. Did Ernie own it now? From Polishing to Publican? He didn't strike me as the kind of man to name a bar after himself, though. Only one way to find out, Mr Diary. I need to go there. I only have a day and a half left before my flight. When I first set foot in America, I had made it as far as 1948. We have at least got up to the mid-fifties now, and this bar would suggest a connection beyond that. But whatever happens now, I've made good progress, and Mr Green is sure to be happy with that. So far I've spent less than £3,000 out of the 10000 he gave me. So I'm well within budget. The streets are packed here. By my reckoning, it would be just as quick to walk as to take a cab. I don't think I could ever tire of the sights and sounds of this city. It's just so vibrant and alive. I wonder if Ernie felt the same. I will update again when I get there. 3.20pm. So there it is. Ernie's bar. I am sat on a park bench of the northeast corner of Madison Square Park, and there it is across the road, barely a stone's throw from where he would have set up his shoeshine business with Robbie. Surely it's too much of a coincidence to have some random bar bearing his name so close to where he worked. There has to be some connection. I can see why he would have chosen this place to start trading too. The location is wonderful. A flat iron building at one end and views of the Empire State at the other. Prime real estate everywhere you look. Back in the 50s, this park would have been populated by businessmen, shoppers, tourists and locals, all going about their daily business. In those days, nobody wore trainers and sportswear. Shoes and boots were the order of the day. The boys must have found a real niche in the market. They certainly seemed to have operated a successful little enterprise. I keep reminding myself that I shouldn't drink on the job, but it would be churlish not to now. I can always raise a glass to Ernie, even if this is the end of the line. Any excuse. I'll take a couple of photos of the place for evidence before going in. To be continued. 5.55pm Is this candid camera? Am I being spied upon? Is Mr Green going to jump out from behind a tree and tell me this is all one big trick? I've said it before and I'll say it again. This case never ceases to amaze me. I'm back on the bench opposite Ernie's letting everything sink in. Again, I had no idea what I was walking into, but I certainly wasn't expecting that. Pushing open the front door, I was blown away by the interior. Every inch of wall space was filled with photographs and ornaments, Dedicated to Ernie, Robbie and incredible feet. I was rooted to the spot for what seemed like an age just staring up around the place. Most of the pictures were in black and white and only a few in colour. In the corner was a small raised platform and on it were the two comfy chairs used by the boys. The red leather trim was well worn, the varnish all but gone from the handles and the legs and the footstools were rusted and twisted beyond repair. But above them, what I guessed to be the original sign, incredible feet, shoe shine for all. On the shelves around the bar were ornaments and trophies, shoes, brushes, empty tins of polish, certificates and signatures. On one side of the room was a huge canvas with incredible feet, wall of fame, written in bold letters across the top. From what I could see from the distance, the board was covered with signatures. 
I was brought back to the real world by the sound of the lady behind the bar. What can I get you, my darling? Would you like a net to help you catch those flies? I realised she was talking to me, and I realised I was stood there with my mouth open. I apologised and made my way to the bar. Ah, a Brit, she said, smiling when I introduced myself. You seem to be quite taken aback by our interior. You have no idea, I replied, managing a little laugh at the same time. A lager, please, and a large whiskey. Any kind. You choose. I think I need it. While she served, I walked over to the Wall of Fame. The barmaid called over to me again. There are some famous names on there. We never know who's going to walk in here next. There must have been over a couple of hundred names and messages scrawled on the canvas. Some left simple signatures. Others had penned messages to go with their names. One said, We even have some of your lot over there, said a lady from the table nearby. Churchill for one, and Bowie. Even that fellow with the emu on his arm. I could not quite take in what she was saying. The canvas was a who's who of top celebrities and prominent people from the last few decades. Tom Hanks was there, Arnie, Michelle Obama, Frank and Nancy, Sid and Nancy, Diana Ross, Mike Tyson, Bon Jovi, Cliff Richard, Tiger Woods, Tina Turner, Spike Lee, Robert De Niro, and so many more besides. I didn't see Churchill's name, but I don't doubt it was on there. The barmaid called over to me again. Can you imagine how much we'd get for that canvas on eBay? I looked around the bar almost in a trance. A smattering of customers were sipping their drinks, reading and generally minding their own business. My presence didn't seem to register with them. It was as if this was just normal. Perhaps it was to them. Not to me, though. This was incredible. Unreal. Amazing, unbelievable. I looked back to the canvas and read some of the messages. An inspiration, Spike Lee. One of a kind, Bob Dylan. My favourite place to chill and relax, Morgan Freeman. My New York man cave, Hugh Grant. At first I thought I was dreaming, but the barmaid brought me back down to earth and reality. We've had to ensure that for a hefty sum. But it's worth it. A real tourist attraction. The Hard Rock Cafe wanted to buy it, but we told them where to go. That'll be $14, my love. I pulled up a stool beside the bar. There were photos behind the optics, with, minor, with both minor and massive celebrities posing in front of the glass, sat with shoeshine, in the shoeshine seats. We took down the pictures with Bill Cosby and O.J. Simpson, she continued. We've got a great reputation here, and we're not going to jeopardise that for the sake of a couple of celebrities gone rogue. I took a sip of my whiskey and let the burn tickle the back of my throat before swallowing. Just what I needed. I still hadn't found my voice, again, but when she was more than happy to talk for me. You look like you needed that, mister. Most visitors here gravitate towards the Wall of Fame. Starstruck tourists like yourself. We never know who's going to walk in that door next. We don't make a fuss, though. We don't want this place to be just a tourist attraction. People find us. We don't go looking for them. For all the famous names over there, it's the other walls that mean more to me. I reached into my pocket and plonked the dictaphone on the bar. I managed to find my voice at last. I explained briefly who I was and why I was in New York. She listened carefully as I retold my story yet again. I told her of Ernie's journey to America, and of the Twins, and the New York Times. I seemed to be rambling on, but she didn't once try and interrupt me. I looked around at one point and realised the other customers were now staring in my direction too. By the time I had finished and told her about my findings at the New York Times offices on the 11th floor, I felt drained. I asked the question I'd asked so many people before. Would you mind if I interviewed you and recorded our conversation on the dictaphone? She stood up straight and smiled the biggest of smiles. 
Mr. Brunskill, it would be my absolute pleasure. Of all the stars that have walked through that door, none have given me such a rush of adrenaline that you have just now. She looked up at the clock. It was just after 4pm. I don't suppose you could hang around for a couple of hours, Paul. Ricky will be back then, and I just know he'd love to speak with you too. We come as a pair, you see. I'm so excited. This is going to knock him out for sure. I finished my drinks and said that I would go for a stroll around the area, but promised to return at 6pm. I'm Deborah, Deborah Hindle. My partner and co-owner of this little establishment is Ricky, Ricky Kirby. We've got a lot to tell you, Paul, an awful lot. We will be waiting for you. You have made my day. No, my year. I left the bar and wandered around in a daze until I found my way back to this bench. I'm still convinced I must be dreaming. But there it is, right in front of me. Ernie's bar. And his pictures are all over the walls. And, and, and. I'll go back in shortly and update you when I get back to the hotel later, Mr Diary. This is turning out to be one hell of a day. <laughs>